Welcome to worship today. We're going to begin by singing a song which is probably familiar to many, El Shaddai. There are a couple of Hebrew phrases in the song. The first, El Shaddai Eleyana Adonai, which means God Almighty, may we praise you. And the second, Erkamkana Adonai, which basically means I love you, Lord. So let's sing this praise to God. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Adonai, age to age you're still the same, by the power of the name, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Kamkana Adonai, we will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. Save the son of Abraham through the power of your hand. You turn the sea into dry land to the outcast on her knees. You are the God who really sees, and by your might, you set your children free. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Eleana Adonai, age to age you're still the same, by the power of the name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Ekamkana Adonai, we will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. I love the message in this next hymn, the awe and amazement of God's gift of Jesus in And Can It Be. Trust in 
Hey, church family. Man, it's been a while. Um, so we've been meeting online with our youth group, and we've been uh, going and surveying the entire Bible, but recently we've been going through Genesis and uh, the whole Old Testament, and man, the history and the story of the Old Testament is so powerful, and I really love going through it again with the kids. Um, I believe that there is a story in there for wherever you are in your life. Um, so let's go to the prayers of the people. <clears throat> God, you are the creator, the God in Genesis, who created all things. Uh, who knows us better than you, God? God, you're also so holy, just like um, when Moses saw the burning bush, you asked him to remove his sandals for he was on holy ground. <clears throat> Lord, help us to build your kingdom, the kingdom of God, like Joshua did, and how Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Help us to rebuild the things that are broken in our life, in other people's lives, um, in our society, Lord. God, just like you provided for the Israelites in the wilderness, we ask that you provide for us too. Help us to rely on your provisions and not seek our own uh, provisions through our own power, Lord. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us like Joseph forgave his brothers. So often we betray you, we betray others, we betray ourselves, Lord. We ask for forgiveness like Joseph. Sometimes we are Joseph's brothers, but other times we need to be like Joseph and forgive others. Help us to forgive, Lord. And Lord, help us and guide us away from temptation. Like Joseph, who, who uh, ran away from Potiphar's wife when facing the temptation. Help us to also flee in the face of temptation. Lord, all of this yeah, for your kingdom and your glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you would please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, or night, wherever you are, and whenever you are watching this. Uh, thanks for joining us for our service, and uh, my name is Jeff. Uh, I'm not the normal um, preaching pastor here at this church, but I have attended here, my family and I have attended here for several years, and so it's good to be able to, to share a message with you. Um, but that being said, it's okay to, you know, send the emails in that say, uh, Jeff, don't quit your day job. Uh, my day job is normally being a, a chaplain over at Memorial Hospital, and so I spend most of my time listening to folks, and uh, today uh, flipping the, scri the script a little bit and uh, trying to put my thoughts to words. Uh, Pastor Dean has been kind of moving us through a series on grace, and so today I'm going to continue uh, talking about grace from dis different aspects. And uh, today's sermon, uh, as you may have seen already, is a gracious and merciful God. And we'll be studying from the book of Jonah. So um, at any time during the sermon or afterwards or before reading through the book of Jonah would be um, a recommendation for me. I think it's a great book where there's a lot uh, in there uh, for God to teach us. And I think a lot that kind of foreshadows the ministry of Jesus and a lot of things that Jesus kind of ties back into uh, from the book of Jonah. So we often think sometimes of Jonah as kind of a children's story. Um, but today I hope to bring it to, to more of a, a, a powerful a lesson, hopefully, that we can, we can all uh, glean some, something from, uh, whether you're a child, a uh, teenager, adult, or a very seasoned uh, adult. Uh, so let me, let's start off with the story. Uh, in the words of the character Indigo from The Princess Bride, uh, as he's explaining to, to the hero in the movie, uh, let me explain. Well... No, there is too much. Let me sum up. 
So in the book of Jonah, um, there's a lot packed into those four chapters, but apparently Jonah is a preacher and a prophet uh, from Israel. And God comes to him and says, I want you to proclaim, to preach, to, to go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim their, their destruction. Now, one would think, if you know anything about Israel, you know something about Nineveh, the capital city, capital city of Assyria, that this would be something that Jonah would be interested in. A good Israelite would maybe want to go to a foreign country and proclaim their destruction. But Jonah seemingly says no, and he jumps on a ship that is heading in the opposite direction. Nineveh's over here, Jonah heads to Tarshish over here, and as we know from the story, there's a, there's a great storm that comes uh, upon the ship and upon the sea. And eventually, uh, when the storm comes, Jonah's asleep, but eventually the crew members throw Jonah overboard. Uh, according to the text, God sends uh, a large fish, uh, a large sea creature, uh, to gobble Jonah up, to swallow him up, and then take him closer to Nineveh and vomit him onto dry land. Um, there's probably more I could say about that, but we'll just we'll let that be for right now. And once Jonah is back on dry land, God gives him a second calling, or the word of the Lord, the word of God comes to Jonah a second time, which is nice. Get a little confirmation for Jonah, um, but also a reiteration of God's hope for him to go to Nineveh. And so maybe reluctantly, but obediently, Jonah goes to Nineveh. As we know, he proclaims... Um, that the Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty days, he says. Forty days and you'll be overthrown. Forty days and you'll be overthrown. And Nineveh does something surprising, at least maybe to our ears, but somehow it wasn't surprising to Jonah. For they repent from the greatest to the least and even the animals. Uh, they repent in hopes that maybe God will relent. That maybe if their repentance is heard by God, that he will relent. And in fact, he does. He changes his mind. God himself repents, changes his mind, and does not destroy Nineveh. This, however, um, is frustrating to Jonah. Jonah becomes angry and, and uh, disappointed uh, that God has not destroyed his enemy. Um, that God has not destroyed the city of Nineveh. And God takes Jonah out and uh, upon a hill and... Uh, asks him some series of questions. Is it right for you to be angry? He gives him a, a plant to give him shade from the hot sun, and then he destroys the plant. And Jonah is very angry about the des destruction of the plant. And God says, is it right for you to be angry about something you did not grow, you did not labor, you did not work for? And he ends the book. The book ends with God asking him this question, should I not be concerned? Should I not be concerned with Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons and also many animals? And as I've kind of already um, talked about the Nineveh, the capital city of, of Assyria, um, would have been a, a, an enemy, was an enemy. And eventually at some point, not knowing when specifically the book of Jonah was written, um, Assyria does take over the northern tribes, the ten tribes of Israel, um, and, and, and captures them. So very much this is the enemy of Israel, and uh, Jonah is going into en enemy territory. And this is a foreshadowing for me of Jesus' teaching about love your enemies. In the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, Jesus talks about loving your enemies. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, says Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He makes, he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same and if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now I have to make a quick caveat that this word perfect is more of a mirror or a reflection. Mirror your Father in heaven. 
uh, it is not about necessarily correctness or rightness or righteousness because earlier he talks about the righteous and the unrighteous. And so therefore, mirror your Father in heaven. In the Gospel of Luke, the last phrase in that section on love your enemies is says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So that's kind of the, the, the take that I will go with, be merciful as your Father is merciful. And this is no small task, but maybe the most difficult calling or invitation in the scriptures is to love one's enemy. Love those who oppose you. However, but I think it is possible. And this story that I want to share was made, um, oh, I don't know, a couple years ago, six years ago, five years ago. I think there was a commercial made kind of out of this story. And, uh, you know, if we can make a story uh, into selling something, I think we will. But the story is in 1914, during World War I, Pope Benedict um, asked the Pope at that time, asked the countries, England, France, and Germany, who were at war, if they would allow a truce for Christmas Day. And even though officially they said no, many of the troops in 1914 were able to uh, have a truce. And they were able to cross enemy lines and talk with one another, particularly in one setting, the English and the Germans uh, laid down their weapons, um, walked across, traded food, traded tobacco, shook hands with one another. Um, I'm told, I've read, even a soccer game broke out. And they even sang carols together, I'm told. And thanks to Wikipedia, I came across this note uh, that a soldier wrote to his mother. Henry Williamson, a 19-year-old private in the London Rifle Brigade, wrote to his mother on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. Dear Mother, I am writing from the trenches. It is 11 o'clock in the morning. Beside me is a coke fire. Opposite me, a dugout, wet with straw in it. The ground is sloppy in the actual trench. trench but frozen elsewhere. In my mouth is a pipe presented by the Princess Mary. In the pipe is tobacco, of course you say, but wait. In the pipe is German tobacco. Ha ha, you say, from a prisoner or found in a captured trench. Oh dear, no. From a live German soldier. From his own trench. Yesterday the British and Germans met and shook hands in the ground between the trenches and exchanged souvenirs and shook hands. Yes, all day Christmas day and as I write. Marvelous, isn't it? This was written by a 19 year old soldier. We know from history that this truce did not last long and that World War I was a very difficult, bloody and humiliating battle for some. However, this story gives me hope that it's possible, that it's possible to lay down our weapons, that it's possible for enemies to shake hands. Loving our enemy is possible. It is possible today, it is possible tomorrow. It may not be natural, it may not be our first instinct, but when it happens, it's marvelous. Here's the deal. We serve a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And God is inviting us and calling us to participate with their work in restoring all things to them through Christ. I use the plural because of our triune understanding of God. We are in the middle of a pandemic that is throwing off our senses of normalcy, both here and throughout our globe. We are entering a season of political discourse and strife with our elections coming up. We are witnessing unrest and protest and violence throughout our country and in other countries as well. It is an easy time to create an us versus them mentality. It is an easy time to say that they're wrong and we're right. And I don't know who the them is for you necessarily. It may be somebody on the other political uh, spectrum. It may be somebody um, on different lines of 
economic issues or policy issues or racial issues or national issues or issues of gender, sexuality, and orientation or theology and belief. You name it, we can create lines. And us versus them mentality comes very easy. However, God is inviting us, I think, to understand that even though we hold our beliefs, which I'm not changing, asking you to change your beliefs necessarily, but to realize more importantly that God has great concern for those who oppose you. And God has great concern and love for those who seem to be on the other side. Whether it's a war or whether it's an argument, whether it's a neighbor that lives across the street, or whether it's a person that lives halfway around the world. God has a heart and a concern for all people. And do not think that God love, God's love, means that there is no justice or no God's justice. But for God, as displayed in the book of Jonah and exemplified in Jesus' life, justice is always a means towards restoration, not obliteration or something else. It's always a means towards restoration. Relationship and healing is the goal. So God is inviting us not only to love our enemies, but participate, as he asked Jonah to participate, but to participate in his love and his justice in our world today. So as God left a question, as the book of Jonah leaves a question for the reader, so I want to leave you with the question. How will you, how will I, how will all of us participate with our good and gracious God who invites us and who calls us into a more and just and loving life? by loving our enemies, by loving our neighbors? How will we participate with God today and how will we participate tomorrow? May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may you hear his invitation to participate in his divine love and justice this day. Amen. Let's come before our amazing God and Savior who knows us personally and sing to our King.
In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Heavenly Father, unclutter our lives. We have too much, consume too much, expect too much. Grant us perspective to see this world through others' eyes, especially those we think of as an enemy. Grant us compassion where there is need to play our part and not turn aside. Grant us gratitude for what we have, our daily bread and the gift of life. Unclutter our lives, Lord. Give us space, simplicity, and thankful hearts. And hear now the assurance of our forgiveness. The word of God says to crawl out of those tombs and prisons. There is a world of light and freedom waiting. The higher and more secure we build the barricades of care and caution to protect ourselves, the deeper grows the grave we call life. Have faith in the giver of life and be free. The word is life. Let us rise up and praise God's holy name, for if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Free at last. We are free at last. Let's sing of this freedom and who you say I am. Free. 
Breathe.